We are looking at the parable today of the workers in the, the vineyard, or the labourers in the, the vineyard. This will be the last of this series for a little while. I may come back to it because there's lots of more parables. But uh, we'll be moving on to doing a session on the period of Lent next week. So the workers in the vineyard. As Jesus was telling what the kingdom of heaven would be like, he said, Early one morning a man went out to hire some workers for his vineyard. After he had agreed to pay them the usual amount for a day's work, he sent them off to his vineyard. About nine that morning, the man saw some other people standing in the market with nothing to do. He said he would pay them what was fair if they would work in their vineyard. And so they went. Key phrase that we have come back to. Jesus is telling about the kingdom of heaven. Okay? At noon... And again at about three in the afternoon, he returned to the market. And each time he made the same agreement with others who were loafing around with nothing to do. Finally, at about five in the afternoon, the man went back and found some others standing there. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. Then he told them to go and work in his vineyard. That evening, the owner of the vineyard told the man in charge of the workers to call them in and give them their money. He also told the man to begin with the ones who were hired last when the workers arrived. The ones who had been hired at five in the afternoon were given a full day's pay. The workers who had been hired first thought they would be given more than the others. But when they were given the same, they began complaining to the owner of the vineyard. They said, the ones who had hired last worked only for one hour. But you paid them the same that you did us. And we worked all day in the hot sun, all day long. The owner answered them, Friend, I didn't cheat you. I paid you exactly what we agreed on. Take your money now and go. What business is it of yours if I want to pay them the same that I paid you? Don't I have the right to do what I want with my money? Why should you be jealous if I want to be generous? Jesus then said, so it is. Everyone who is now first will be last. And everyone who is last will be first. Another key phrase in this story. This parable of the workers. Jesus is talking to a group of his disciples and others. And he tells the story about the kingdom. They've, they've got round to the kingdom about this owner, generous owner of the vineyard, who pays his workers the same, whether they work 12 hours or one hour. Because the working day in Israel would have been 6 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock in the evening, around harvest time. And as we all know, when the harvest is ripe, then it needs to be picked. Otherwise, it loses its best. And we have the same problem today in many respects, isn't it? Is that many farmers struggle to get the amount of workers in to bring in the harvest. For the same reasons, they want to get the harvest at its peak so it gets into storage and 
process it, etc. So they get the most money and we get the best value from the sweetness of the food. And as we heard that story, if, imagine yourself, and that was the normal way for labourers who didn't own property or anything or needed to earn some money, was to go into the marketplace and all, usually the farmers or other workers who wanted to hire people, they would go down to the working place and seek to get extra labourers in especially at harvest time. And that still goes on in various parts of the country today. There are places known to certain people, and if you need day work, odd jobs here and there, you can go to these such places and get hired for a day's work. More common in other countries abroad that I've been to where you see this quite often, but it's an acceptable practice. But I'm not sure it'd be acceptable practice that you would pay the workers you got at the beginning of the day and if you picked up some later. It sounds extravagant, doesn't it? You imagine the unions having a real go if something like this happened on, in our workplace today. It doesn't seem fair. But what's this parable all about? It's not about unfairness. Well, this is one of those parables that I said often we have to do. You have to read it in the context of what Jesus is speaking about. Because here he's been speaking to this crowd for some time. So we need to go back into verse 19. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. That's obviously God. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He said. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honour your father and mother, and love your neighbour as yourself. All these I've kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it's hard for a rich, the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With human beings this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Now this is the key phrase that we need to take care of. This is what Jesus is addressing in the parable of the vineyard. It's the question that Peter asks when he's talking about, Jesus is talking about people coming into the kingdom of heaven. The rich man, he says, will struggle with this because he doesn't want to give up his earthly possessions. He only thinks obeying a few rules is good enough. Then Jesus said this truly I tell you at the renewal of all things when the son of man sits on his glorious throne you who have followed me will also sit on my twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or wife or children or fields 
For my sake we will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Ah, so Jesus has already mentioned this phrase about the first and the last. Jesus is explaining the principles of the kingdom of God here. And he's telling the disciples very much that serving him in the kingdom of heaven is great. But don't expect monetary rewards or gaining thrones in heaven as a reward for serving me. Your reward will come. But it's not about receiving power and riches. It's about receiving Jesus, his kingdom, and knowing that you will spend life with him and God, the Father, in eternity. This is a paradoxical statement, really, about the first and the last. Because it seems strange that those who come to Jesus at the last minute, or the landover, as he's saying in the last moment, will get the same reward as those who've been serving him for longer. And this is true for us today in terms of the kingdom. It doesn't matter whether you've served Christ for decades, your reward will be the same for those who serve Christ for a short time. This is the way of the kingdom. It's not about earning rewards or tributes or position or power. It's about receiving an inheritance. And Jesus is explaining all this through this simple parable. Everybody in Israel would have known the importance of the grape harvest. It was one of the most significant industries in the land, in the world, and of course it still is today. Jesus pitches, pitches a landowner, a rich landowner, who's like God, trying to harvest the people on earth and to bring them into the kingdom. And God reaches out into the places where we are gathered in order to invite us to come and join and be part of the kingdom. And so he uses this imagery of a story for people to understand that we shouldn't look for rewards, monetary rewards, when we become Christians or inheriting powerful positions. Jesus had to speak at another time about that when one of the disciples' mothers asked Jesus what position they were going to have in heaven. And Jesus says it doesn't work that way. We cannot build up our expectations of a greater, greater palace in heaven because we've served Jesus every day of our lives. That's not the way the kingdom works. The first will be last and the last first. The kingdom is a place that is opposite to the world, totally. The other thing, strange thing about this 
The landover questions those who he's only picked up an hour before sunset. Why are you loafing around? Interesting question. Why haven't you been working? God is out there. Were these workers not making themselves available? Did they get up early enough to be there in the crowd to be hired at six o'clock or nine o'clock or whatever? Or oh, they're only showing up at the last time, believing that they might show something that they were interested in working, gaining useful employment, but not. But it's very easy for us to look back on this. But of course, at the time Jesus told this parable, there were people who were not really looking for the kingdom to come. The kingdom had been announced by the pro the coming of the kingdom had been announced by the prophets. It had been shouted to Israel during the time of John the Baptist that the kingdom was coming. And yet still others were not looking for it. And that's what else we see here. It seems that, to me, the story is about the disciples and their growing belief that they were going to become rich and famous because of their relationship with Jesus. Because that's what normally happens if you join a movement, isn't it? And are in the founding emblems of that movement and that movement becomes powerful. People would expect a position when they reign with authority. But that's not what Jesus is saying. And it's a very interesting parable about the kingdom. There's a modern day version of it. <laughs> interesting, isn't it? But you can imagine a scenario in a modern day setting or in an older day setting that it would cause troubles. Those who would, were employed first couldn't see that if he was going to pay somebody the, the amount he'd promised to pay them for only doing a short amount of work, you would think he would be extra generous to those who started first thing. Not quite. I like what uh, Nigel Wright says. God's grace, in short, is not the sort of thing you can bargain with or try to store up. It isn't the sort of thing that one person can have a lot of and someone else only a little. The point of the story is that what people get from having served God and his kingdom is not actually a wage at all. It's not strictly a reward for work done. God doesn't make contracts with us as if we could bargain or negotiate for a better deal. He makes covenants in which he promises us everything and asks of us everything in return. God keeps his, he kept his promises to all the workers, that landowner. And that's what our God is like. Whatever the circumstances we come to him through, whether we've been big sinners or little sinners, doesn't make a difference to God. I can always remember hearing Cliff Richards' testimony at one of Billy Graham's events. And he was talking about how he came to Christ and how he had to understand that if Hitler, in those last hours in the bunker of the last hours of the war, before he committed suicide, had asked God to forgive him, God would have given him and he would have found a place in heaven for him. 
That's a big thing to understand. Now, there's no sense that we ever knew that hit that happened to Hitler or any other despot at the last moment. But that's the reality of the forgiveness of God, which we have to come to terms with as Christians. But we need to understand something of what the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is. Whenever you see the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven in the New Testament, either phrase means the same thing. But it's the spiritual rule over the hearts and minds and the lives of those who are submissive to God. The definition from the Biblical Images Dictionary. Jesus declares the kingdom to have arrived. We thus read here and there in the Gospels about the kingdom as something that has come near and that has come to you. This kingdom is something that is accordingly proclaimed to prospective citizens. See, it is a king kingdom of which one becomes a citizen, not by natural birth, but new birth. It's something that we need to enter and indeed need to possess. The kingdom of God in the New Testament is inherited, it's revealed, it's spoken of as good news and to be heralded. Once a person has entered the kingdom, it's something that they possess forever. As the repeated declarations in the Beatitudes of Jesus remind us, remember the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is speaking about the kingdom of heaven is a place, a realm that we inherit when we give our lives to him and to follow him. We have to make that conscious decision to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not about asking to come part of the kingdom of heaven. It's part of recognising that Jesus is Lord and creator of all, seeking forgiveness and promising to follow him brings us in to the kingdom of heaven. In one sense, we do have to abandon other allegiances that we may have been involved in. But we can all, with a simple prayer request and a willingness to seek to follow Jesus, to become citizens of heaven. You see, God's kingdom was established through Jesus' mission. That's how the kingdom came into being. That's why the kingdom is good news. God created us to save us to this kingdom from the very beginning. And the kingdom became real during the reign of the prophets. It came into being at the death of Jesus and will come again for a second time to complete his reign when Christ returns again. The kingdom has come, therefore it now exists and it will come again in greater power. The picture we get from Jesus' mission unfolds in his teaching, like this one, about the kingdom. This is what the kingdom will be like. There will be many people in the kingdom you may not recognise as Christians at one stage, 
but they've entered at the last minute and we must be aware of that fact. And one of the things we should do, we should pray for this kingdom to come. We've already done that this morning, don't we? Every time we say the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, it's a prayer to bring in that final time when Jesus will come again and we will be absorbed into the kingdom of heaven on earth. John Piper. How can the kingdom of God be both not yet present and already present. He says, pray for it. It's coming. It's not yet here. It's not going to be immediate. And yet already it's present in your midst, upon you at hand. How can he say that? The answer is the kingdom of God is God's reign. His sovereign action in the world to redeem and deliver a people and then at a future time finish it and renew his people and the universe completely. Not to get to in the kingdom. So, establishing God's reign through Jesus. That's the period we are in now. And when the local church is at its best. We experience the kingdom in our hearts. That's the, the kingdom is community. And when the church is at, working at its best, you should know and have that sense in your heart and spirit that the kingdom is present in your life. Next week, then, the glory of the cross as we enter the period of Lent.